Hi, thanks for checking out Next Level Carpentry. You know, I get a fair amount of questions about how I set up and organize my shop here. And this video about an unusual storage rack system that I made for hanging and organizing the flex ducts I use for my dust processing system when they're not in use will give you a bit of insight into that question. You can see the finished product here to give you some insight into all the various pieces parts that it took to make, assemble, and install this unique flex duct storage rack system. The whole purpose of the rack is to have an easy to use, out of the way place to store sections of flex duct from my desk collection system when it's not in use. This setup, as is, works fine for standard height ceilings or for really tall people. Since my shop ceiling is 11 feet high, I still need to make a rod to lift and remove sections of this flex duct from the rack, so I won't need a stepladder to do it. But I'll put that part into a future video, so stay tuned if you have ECHS like I do. Of course I realize that few viewers are ever going to build a rack just like this for the same purpose, but I do believe that you'll find plenty of tips, tricks, tools, and techniques in the build process that can be used on all sorts of different but similar projects that you need to tackle. So stick around to watch and learn. I'll start off by notching, drilling, and tapping these flat steel clip bars that are the main component of these hose hanger plugs. So I best quit yattering and get to it. Just so you know, for my dust collection system, I use these slick quick disconnect or QD fittings and this heavy duty anti-static flex duct from Air Handling Systems. I'll link to their website in the video description if you're interested in these components or anything else in their catalog for your dust collection needs. Since I have the female part of the QDs attached to my machines, I made the hanger discs so they clip onto the male part of the fitting. These clip bars are made from quarter inch by three quarter inch flat steel stock cut to five and a half inches long for the four inch duct and to seven and a half inches long for the six inch duct size. I put a mark one half inch in from each end of the bars for a groove that the QD clip can engage. I use a wood spacer block in the clamp of my Milwaukee dry cut saw to hold the bars in position for cutting a groove an even one eighth inch deep in both ends of each of the clip bars. Then using an angle grinder with an eighth inch cutoff wheel, I chase through the saw groove to even up the bottom of the groove to a consistent depth widen it a bit and ease sharp edges so the QD clip engages smoothly in use. Using the same disc, I grind away about 1 8 inch off each edge of both ends to reduce the clip bar width to the 1 half inch spacing of the QD clips and then ease all the ground edges with the disc. A quick once over on a wire wheel smooths off roughness left by the grinding process. With fabrication completed on all the bars, I give them a quick test fit on a 6 inch QD fitting to make sure everything is as it needs to be, and it's a firm, reliable attachment. I ripped some pieces of 3 quarter inch thick Russian birch plywood, and then plowed 3 quarter inch wide by 1 quarter inch deep dados in them so that the clip bars fit flush and snug in the grooves. Next, I used a hole saw to cut out discs that are 3 and 3 quarter inch diameter for the 4 inch QDs, and then used the bandsaw to cut discs 5 and 3 quarter inches in diameter for the 6 inch QDs. The rough cut discs are a little too big to fit into the QD fittings, so I made a couple quick templates from quarter inch MDF material, and then used a flush trim router bit and a Bosch Colt router to trim them to size for a smooth snug fit. You can see with those steps complete that the discs fit into the fittings and the clip bars fit nicely into their respective discs. After marking and center punching for holes one and a quarter inches in from each end of all the clip bars, I drilled pilot holes with a number eight size drill bit on the drill press. The drill press vise and a few drops of cutting oil make quick, safe work of this step. The next step was to tap out these pilot holes to quarter twenty thread size. And I really like these drill and tap bits from Greenleaf for this job. Using a dip of thread cutting oil, they're much quicker, faster, and easier than spinning a tap wrench manually for all these holes. And you'll see this Greenleaf product in its case later on in the video, if it's something you're interested in. With that bit of messy metal fab out of the way, I go back to the discs, easing the edges with a quarter inch shank, one eighth inch roundover bit in the Colt router. This quick step really puts a finishing touch on the QD hanger discs. After routing, I give the discs a once over with 120 grit sandpaper on a cushioned gator sanding block to prep them for finishing. 
These discs would work just fine without any finish on them, but I slapped a generous coat of Diamond Vogel's natural grain stain on each one to make them look a little better and to keep shop grime from building up on the blonde wood over time. After the finish dried, I placed a clip bar notches up in the disc dado and drilled down through the discs through the tapped holes with the number 7 bit and, off camera, chased the hole through the disc with a quarter inch bit for a clearance hole. Flipping the discs over, I used a countersink bit so the 3 quarter inch quarter 20 flathead Phillips machine screws could be driven in flush with the blocks to hold the clip bars to the discs. Now the assembly is ready for a trial fit in the QD fitting and it looks marvelous. Since I chose golf balls to use for hanging these ducts, I need to safely and accurately drill holes through the center of one golf ball for each hanger. To get that done, I used what I call a double V-block fixture. To make the double V-block fixture, I first ripped a 45 degree groove in the face of a chunk of scrap wood about 10 inches long. I made this V-cut in a couple passes to sneak up on the final depth. To prevent kickback of the loose V-piece on the final pass, I switched to a custom professional push stick modified with an extra long heel to push the V-scrap all the way past the blade so it can't kick back. Now, with a flat face of the V-scrap against the fence of the miter saw, I cut both ends at a 45 degree angle and then cut it approximately in half. To clean things up, I trim off both ends of the V-block and now you can see how well a double V-block fixture holds a dimpled sphere in place for drilling. I glued the V-scraps into the V-block with Starbond CA glue and then drew center lines in both directions. Next, with a quarter inch bit in the drill press, I drilled down through the very center of the double V and down through into the sacrificial table on my drill press. Putting a short piece of quarter inch all thread into the hole in the table and placing the hole of the fixture on top of it aligns it and holds it in place for repetitively drilling accurately through the center of a Callaway Super Soft Golf Ball. Easy peasy. After carefully rotating the golf ball so logo and lettering are lined up, I start by drilling a quarter inch diameter hole about halfway through from the top of the ball. Then I can stop Grip the ball with vice grips to hang on to it while drilling the rest of the way through the ball. It's a bit of fuss for just one ball, but it's time well spent for drilling a batch. With pilot holes drilled, I clamp each ball in the vise and countersink the hole in the top of the ball until the head of a 3 inch long quarter 20 thread Phillips flathead machine screw fits flush with the top of the ball and then I run the screw through the ball until it's seated in the countersink. Off camera, I drill the number 8 hole through the center of each clip bar and then, as you can see here, I chase that hole through with the Greenlee quarter 20 drill and tap bit. Next I cut a 1 inch long piece of 5 8 OD aluminum pipe for each of the hangers and, using the pipe stub as a spacer, slip the screw through the pipe and securely fasten the Callaway to the clip bar to complete the QD hanger plugs. With the hanger part complete, I start making the hangee part by drilling 2 inch holes in one face of a 32 inch long piece of 3 inch square steel tube. Even with a clamp, slow RPM and a healthy dose of cutting oil, making this sizable hole is a little intimidating. I drill 5 holes like this, spaced for 2 lengths of 6 inch flex and 4 lengths of 4 inch flex. Flipping the square tube 90 degrees to the next face, I drill 5 holes 3 quarter inches in diameter in the adjacent face, aligning centers with the 2 inch holes. And this is another smoky screaming scenario. Next, I use the Milwaukee dry cut saw to make cuts for a 3 quarter inch wide slot to connect the 3 quarter inch holes to the 2 inch holes. To prevent a fracas, I stopped short of cutting these tabs completely free with this saw. Now I can use a 40 thousandths cutoff wheel in my 5 inch Metabo grinder to safely cut the tabs free and clean up the edges of these slot cuts. A quick pass with an 80 degree flap disc around all the drilled and cut edges removes burrs from the outside of the hanger tube for a nice smooth fit and finish. Now you can see how the hanger plugs fit into these hangy slots. Quick, clean and simple, right? Using a general deburring tool, I worked to clean up sharp burrs on the inside of the holes, slots and tube. I got the job done, but this was really a pain to do. A die grinder with a small grinding burr would have been a better choice, but hey, with a bit of inefficient struggle, I got her did. To anchor this hanger securely to the shop ceiling, I had to attach boards to the steel tube to span roof truss bottom cords. For that, I located, center punched, and pre-drilled and tapped four holes in the top face of the 3 inch square tube with the same tools and bits used previously. The center punch step positively locates hole centers and guides the pilot bit for quick, accurately located holes. Drilled and tapped holes provide amazing holding power for the quarter 20 thread Phillips panhead screws I'll use to attach wood to steel. 
I milled up a couple of ash 2x4s 30 inches long and, using dimensions from my ceiling location, drilled four holes 5 16 inch diameter with a brad point bit in one end of each piece to align with the tapped holes in the steel tube. I stopped short of drilling all the way through with this bit so that the tip of the brad point bit left the centering point for the next step. Using the centering hole from the brad point bit as a guide, I drilled a 3 quarter inch by 3 8 inch deep counter bore on the opposite face of the ash boards to recess the heads of the panhead machine screws with flat washers that I'll use to attach this wood to the steel tubes. I laid out holes at 24 inches on center for Torx lags that will hold the hanger tube to the ceiling and center punch them for easy drill location. I start these holes with a 3 quarter inch Forstner bit to counter bore for each lag. Next, using a standard quarter inch twist drill, I line the center of this drill bit with the center of the Forstner bit and drill a clearance hole through the center of the counter bore and through the ash board. This will allow the lags to tighten below the surface of the board for a finished look that I prefer. With all that drilling done, I take a minute to ease all the exposed edges of this mounting block with a 3 16 roundover bit. Again, I'm using it handheld in my handy Colt router. I want a positive connection between steel tube and ash board, so I laid out and cut wide, shallow dados on one end of each ash board where the connection screw holes are. Too lazy to switch to a dado blade, I made multiple, multiple passes with a thin kerf blade, of all things, to make two 2 and 7 8 inch wide dados. The lazy man works the hardest, right? The 3 inch wide tube rocks on its rounded corners in the dado groove, so I whip out a sharp block plane and quickly chamfer the dado edges for a nice, firm, positive fit of tube to board. Trolls will no doubt accuse me of overkill long before this point in the video, but since I ignore their opinions on a regular basis and follow my how you do anything is how you do everything credo, I use a jumbo oops eraser to clean up layout marks and 150 grit sandpaper on a bodyman sanding block to remove sharp corners and router burns and smooth up all the faces of these blocks. Okay, I can see it's overkill for sure, but wait, there's more. Clean wood doesn't stay that way long, so these nice looking boards get a full, wet seal coat of Sherwin Williams pre cat lacquer to lock down loose wood fibers. I really like this product because it easily dries fast enough in a warmish shop to sand and finish coat it within an hour. So I shoot on that second coat and set the pieces out in the hot sun for another long hour to cure out before handling and assembly. While the lacquer is drying, I clean the steel tube with lacquer thinner and a scotch bright pad, hit it with a light coat of gray primer from a rattle can, and follow that up with a full wet coat of a dark gray metallic hammered finish spray paint. This gives it a poor man's powder coated finish look that's more than good enough for this rack, in my humble opinion. A pro tip for maximizing the hammered look to this paint is to give the whole piece a full wet coat and, while it's still wet, back off to about 18 inches distance with the spray can and use a rotating motion to mist on more paint. I find that something about this sequence and method really increases the fisheye effect in the paint, giving it a noticeably unrattle can look when dry. Another pro tip for using rattle cans is to always invert the can and spray until just air comes out. Then, with the can still inverted, put the cap back on and store the can upside down. The date on the bottom of this can tells you that I've had it for over eight years and it sprayed today like I just bought it. This panning shot shows you how much of the hammered effect I get using this process. Once done spraying, I carefully put the steel tube out in direct sunlight for a few hours to cure out the heavy coat of this spray paint too. Once all the pieces are dry, they're ready for assembly on a towel on my work table saw extension. I tap flat washers into the counter bores and then drive stubby quarter twenty thread Phillips panheads machine screws cut to length to hold the ash boards to the rack tube for a nice clean strong connection. This is the level of fit and finish I strive for. You can see here that even the machine screws are flush on the inside of the hanger tube. The final step for assembly is to pre-drive three and a half inch Torx lags into each of the mounting holes so they're already in place when I wrestle the assembly to the ceiling for attachment. Next, I do a carpenter's dance up a step ladder with a hose rack for a partner and, with a bit of gymnastics, work the rack into position and hold it there with a fully extended fast cap third hand hand clamp. Once the rack is in position and aligned with location marks made earlier, I simply drive the Torx lags home. Doing a lopsided pull up on the rack after installation tells me this design is plenty strong for everything I'll ever need to hang from it. To give the whole system a test run, I clip hanger plugs onto one end of each piece of flex duct and dance up the ladder again. You can see here why a lifting bar is necessary for shops like mine with tall ceilings because going up and down a step ladder to hang and retrieve duct sections this way is far from easy to use and efficient, but I think you'll agree that this system is fairly elegant for its purpose. 
I'll take this opportunity to give a shout out to all the patrons who go above and beyond for next level carpentry. Support from all the current active subscribers listed here helps make producing videos like this possible. So I want to express my thanks for your consideration and contribution. Thank you. You guys are the best. And I hope all viewers will consider subscribing to Next Level Carpentry if you haven't already. I'm hoping to reach a goal of 250,000 subscribers by the end of 2020 or sooner. So thanks for your subscription. I appreciate it as well. As always, you'll find helpful links to tools, supplies, swag, and Patreon in the video description below. So head there after the video to find what you're looking for. As for me, now that I finally got all my ducks in a row, I'll sign off by saying, as always, until next time, thanks for watching. Now that I finally got all my ducks in a row, quack, 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 quack.